please join me in welcoming uh, the, the very well-esteemed Kenneth Lee. You, you need to... Okay. Okay. Uh, this uh, topic is uh, mentioned in TSC uh, years ago, but many of us uh, do not know the idea behind open source, and we ha have a lot of newcomers. They keep asking the same question about why I come here to join this activity. Then I try to explain that here once again and hope it helps you. <coughs> so this presentation is about why you are here, and how can you explain to your manager you are here for work, not for vacation? Because I keep asking by my manager or my friends, see, Ken, you go to Las Vegas. So cool, <laughs> right? <coughs> so if you are the manager, then I try to explain how you and your organization get benefit by joining the uh, open source activity. This is me. I joined Huawei about 20 years, and most of my career is work as a software architect for Huawei's product and their telecom product. Uh, so this is a share about open source from a business software architect. And I'm proud to say uh, most of my product uh, were well broadly within Huawei. Almost most of Huawei's uh, networking equipment use my uh, operating system distribution. Uh, and also I worked with Linaro for about six years. I get the plane uh, last year, and when I got it, uh, I leave the stage immediately. And my friends asked me, hi Ken, why you don't you cheer on the stage? And then I told them, oh my God, I forgot. <laughs> this is normally the basic culture of China. People do not want to be focused, but they don't know why. And I try to explain to you. That's come from a very old Chinese book called Dao De Jin. And there is a statement inside. It said, fat always go to the reverse direction of its name. If you got something, yeah, Ken, you are good. That means, Ken, you are so bad. <laughs> Let's see why. Dao De Jin is a very uh, popular book in China. Almost every of them know some of the statement. Uh, it's a little like the Bible in the Western culture. But most of Chinese do not read it, and they do not know what it's talking about, because it's something mysterious. This is, in the title, it's his first um, statement. Uh, literally, he said, Dao can be Dao, and uh, Dao, okay. Way, a road can be road, and name can be name, but it's not the general road or not the general way. And you don't know what it's talking about, but his concept is simple. He said, when we see the world, we, we hit by the sensor. We, we see a lot of data of the world. But when we start to think about it, or we try to talk about it, we use a name. But name is network the fact. It's network the reality. So if you investigate the name and make it shining, the fact will be of the name. And you investigate on the fact itself, you will change the fact, and the name will not be there. So we thought, we're talking about the world, or we think about the world by the name, by the fact. But actually, that's just the name, it's not the fact. The fact always be of you if you really push hard on the name itself. So it's very easy to make confusion. When I talk about something, I talk about the name, but you have to make sure the name point to the reality. Open source is almost the same concept here. You talk about open source, you refer to the source itself. You are not talking about open itself. So, I, I, will, I will let you know why this has happened. <laughs> See, when we start to bring up a name, normally you are interested, you, you, you feel interesting for a pattern. You see something, you want to talk about it, 
you create a name. If you are not interested that at all, then you don't need a name. So normally, a name is a problem. People, when people see the name, they try to solve the problem, they try to turn it good or bad, or uh, higher or shorter, or um, longer, uh, sorry, higher or lower, and longer or shorter. They always talk about to change the name from left to right or from right to left. They try to make his uh, efforts according to that. But by Dr. Jin, he said about that, if you really want to solve the problem, the view behavior you need to do is you turn it off. Because when you make something good, it should be something bad compared to this good. So if you really solve a problem, you should turn the name off. You should, you, you should not strengthen it. You try to do it harder, like open source. You try to do open source harder. That means you fail to make your private code better or your product better. So it's not the normal way you should spend your efforts on open source. Okay, now we come back to see what its architecture design is. I do open source for, uh, uh, no, no, sorry. I do architecture design for about 15 years. And then my understanding to architecture design is to design and maintain a log logic chain to fulfill your final goal. You want to make a product good and use broadly. Then you should create a logic for the first year, you have some software, and then second year, you have the hardware ready, and the third year, you hope your customers can adopt your solution. Then you have a lot of dependency and threat. And we try to push our engineer, uh, software engineering to make something happen. But as an architect, my work is to make sure we don't need to do everything. Because if you do everything by yourself, then you will spend all your efforts to make, make things happen. And then you will lose the trip of how to, how to achieve the goal. So normally, when I work so many years, uh, the system engineer is to make fat happen. But an architect to make things do not happen, do not need to happen. So normally, most of our, my manager or my colleague, they will aware um, the, the system engineer do a lot of things. They have the name. But normally, they don't aware an architect doing because we, our job is to turn the name off. Only we, when we turn the name off, we can reach the goal. So many, many said uh, in Chinese culture, people do not believe anything. But actually, they do. They believe the reality of the world. And they call that Tao, because it is a road leads you, lead you to the goal. But if you follow the goal, uh, follow the Tao, you follow the reality, then you have no name. Then that's the way to, to make successful, uh, to make things uh, happen and to change the world. So now, we can explain why you do open source. You have a bunch of private source code to keep it safe. And it won't be if you cannot ensure the development direction of the ecosystem. You have a lot of very good code, but don't use it. Then how can you sell to, the, to your customer? That's the reason you join open source activity. It doesn't mean that open source is so good. It means is the way people can join together to, to make the ecosystem work, right? And many people ask, uh, I come to Linaro, want to take some code because they have some private code key inside their repository. But no, there's no, right? If you want to take the code, you can stay at your home and then you can take it immediately. That's not the reason you come here. 
And you are not going to develop the code together with your competitor. You won't try hard in this uh, case. And the source code without trying hard made no sense for you to rely on. I find that a lot of project, open source project and uh, activity failed at last because from the very beginning, people do not want to contribute anything. They want to take something. Then there is nothing there. Then how can you take it? So finally, you spend a lot of effort and you want to cheat the others and hope the others join and work hard for you and then you want to take it. You never get it, right? You think that's a clever strategy, but that's just a waste of your time. And also some people say that they, they can ask Linaro to do something for them. I don't believe that. Because you don't sign a contract with Linaro, and then if Linaro delay for you, you can't do anything. If you want to do that, then just pay an outsourcing team and you can get it immediately. And if they don't get it on time, then you can, right? There is some punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, when you come here as an individual and you are a competitor with your internal team, I, I, I always had the same problem. When I joined here, then my internal said, I can, you go to open source again. You are not belong to me. You are my competitor. And then you, you tell them, yeah, I, I go there to get some code for you. But they're always wrong because they can get the code by themselves. Even the code written by you is written by you. But it's already open source, right? They can get it immediately. And then they don't need you. People need a person. Only he go in to need you. It's, if they already get benefit from you, they don't need, need you anymore. You become a burden of him, right? You, 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 you get some code from outside and get, give it to them, and then they, they, they already get it. They own you. They need to pay back in the future. So they, they won't like you anymore. Only when they need you to take the code once again, they will like you, right? And this is another question normally people will ask me. I work for telecom industry for a long time, and the normal way in telecom industry is join the, open, uh, join the standard organization. The standard organization's way is we send a team to standard organization, we persuade, they adopt the solution, and then uh, we get some pattern from uh, the pattern bureau, and then we start to implement that uh, pattern then that's, that's done. So in most cases, people just write down, you need to do it this way. That's all. But today, most of the standard organization become an open source community. Why? Because from the beginning, the code is driven by requirements. You have several functions, and then you create a framework to connect all these functions together. But after you have that base of the code, then you start to driven by the competition. It's not reasonable. People need to change the framework or the function itself everywhere. And most of the code is this kind of, in this style. So, <coughs> uh, the, the standard way is not working anymore. Uh, still, we have standard organization, but it's less and less because too complex. When I work for GSM system, a MSC node, we have a 300K ROC, a 3K, a 300 line of code. But now if you take a look in Android phone, Android phone is about 10 times of the code. And still, when you write the code, you, you, the efficiency is the same. You cannot control it. So today, when you get the code, you cannot control any, uh, every part of the, the code base. You have to change everywhere. Then without open source community, you, you can't do anything. And once again, internal team always challenge. Even yesterday, my colleague, some of the newcomer, 
they ask me, hey, Ken, the open source is better. We have a more advantage on that. We're doing better. I said, yeah, you are doing better, but who use it? Right? Nobody use it. Open source is a conclusion. Everybody agree we should going to use it in this way. And private branch means you just do it by yourself in that way. So your, your code will be better performance, will be better quality because you fix it up. You get open source code and you add a lot of proprietary solution and, and you make it fixed, you make it stable, you test it for five years, oh, sorry, maybe five months and release to the market. Yeah, it will be better quality and better function, but people do not agree with that. Open source means people already agree with that, then that's why why it can stay for long? Normally, we will have a, 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 my experience. I have an architecture branch, no matter inside or outside. And then I put the long-term strategy there. And then internally, when I sell to the market, I have my branch. But that branch, I can last for maybe five years or six years. That's all. It should be end. And then you should take another new release from the architecture branch. So I can save most of my time. I don't need to push mo uh, many of my code again to the new solution. And then I, I, I make most of my engineer free with no name, right? I give an example how we design the ex external uh, strategy for open source. This is uh, uh, ERP. Uh, from the beginning, when we bring up the, uh, the idea of ERP, people think, oh, we are going to make another distribution. Actually, if you take a look to this picture, it's a distribution. But if we do a distribution, we become a competitor with the other business uh, distribution provider. And then they will leave the ecosystem. Then why bother? If I want to create another competitor, it's easy. I create an, uh, another company, and then I direct a sell to the market. That's all. Why I bother to spend so many resources and bring some, so many person and try to persuade them and then create a distribution? That's not the sense. So this is, is the view strategy of ERP. In Daozhen, again, there is a methodology. It said, Sun Yun is, uh, sorry, okay, it's all Chinese. Um, he talked about we should do something with no harm and we try to give benefit with no name. Because when you give a name, uh, you, you bring the name, people own you. When they own you, they hate you. <laughs> you. You don't want to say that, right? But actually, that's the way. So what we try to do is, we doesn't compete with the ecosystem. We are not going to create another competitor in the ecosystem. It's not a long-term supported version. A distribution is a long-term supported version. So it's not going to long-term support. I upgrade the version uh, every uh, half year. Uh, we try to make it uh, four, uh, 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 half, uh, sorry, half years. We try to make it uh, six months. So it will be upgraded very fast. So it's not going to be a distribution. So it's not going to compete with any distribution. And it's not a landing project for SOC. It doesn't mean I'm going to support your SOC. It means if uh, I release a new release, I hope your internal SOC team join and then enable that. So uh, they still need to do something. They need to do something. They are valuable. So they will like to join it. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. So if I do that, no matter they're happy or not happy, they will try to avoid to join. Because if I do, do uh, open source do the same and SOC enable team do the same, they will compete again. No matter they want to or they, they don't want to. So for ERP, it's not going to compete with the ecosystem. And, but you have to 
give benefit to the ecosystem. So we try to make that happen. Uh, the strategy is we, it is the only version that can support the latest feature and the latest uh, Linux kernel for ARM server hardware. You can, you can buy a uh, distribution, but normally that's a com commercial uh, distribution and he will support maybe one year or two years ago technology. But you, if you want to do something new, then he gives you the benefit. And any new feature can be merged into a next ERP version, but we are not keep this today. If you cannot hold it, Suppose uh, uh, SOC provider or uh, uh, Linux distribution provider, they want to persuade people to use that uh, solution. Then they should try hard to make, make, that, hap make that happen. And people can get uh, benefit from that. But if Linaro do it by themselves, then people will leave. This is the trick of open source. You do more, people will leave. But open source is way is to let people join. It's not do it by yourself. I remember last year, uh, Jonathan uh, from LWN.net, he said uh, a maintainer of, Linux, uh, of open source community is to create a weapon. He doesn't try to do something for the others. He tries to do something people will like to join you to provide their effort. So it's valuable to join the community. It's not you provide something good to the others, so they will join the community. And I also try, work hard to make all the narrow uh, common feature will be developed and verified only on ERP. So it's also valuable for you to, to join and then to persuade the others to adopt your solution. So finally, you can compatible with the ecosystem, with the others. And if you do everything by your own, then you don't need to join because that's your private strength. People, you have no need for the other to help you, right? So think about that. Many of our open source activity is a waste of time. If you don't need people to join your ecosystem, you don't need to go open source. So this is the conclusion. Again, I'm sorry. It's a, a, a statement from the uh, it means um, the best king, because Dr. Jin is a book written to the king. Uh, the king do not uh, selfish, selfish, so he get his selfish. It's, it's, again, it's not easy to understand, but the way is this. When we work with um, open source community by helping it, because we help it, we are compatible with it. Because it's compatible with you, so it belongs to you. Right? You have a room, and in, inside the room, everything, you, have, you feel comfortable. So the room be, belongs to you. You have a room, have a lot of expensive things, but you, you don't use it. Then the room is not belong to you. So if you take it without contribute to the ecosystem, then it becomes your burden. It's never belong to you. So please enjoy the feast of open source activity and by contribute your efforts. And if you belong to you and belong to us. Thank you. I need to answer question or okay. We've been We've introduced the topic of open source license compliance and last connect, and we received extremely positive feedback and a plea for more. So we have two great speakers today, and the first license compliance workshop in Chinese at 11 a.m. in this room by Lucian Chen from the Open Culture Foundation. And now please welcome Shane Coughlin, director of the Open Chain Project. Hello all, and thank you so much for welcoming me back to Linaro uh, Connect. I was here a couple of years ago with Harold Velte to talk about open source compliance. At that time, Harold and I essentially 
talked about two different sides of open source and compliance and governance. Harold talked about how the community and individual developers view compliance, and I talked about how companies view compliance. Now, in some ways, that made a lot of sense to show two perspectives. But in other ways, it also makes it seem like there's two communities, one community of individuals and one community of corporates. In reality, of course, here in open source, we're all so interdependent that we're really one community, and we shouldn't split things too far. Today is really going to be about an assessment of where open source compliance is and where we're going next. One of the key things to start with is probably that open source is not a solution. Open source is a fabric from which we can create solutions. And it has become so successful that it is in every area of computing today. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was at an automotive conference where we talked about not only open source in cars, but open source across the embedded cloud and enterprise system as well. And one thing that was evident at that time was that everyone is becoming clearly aware that open source as a fabric, as a platform, is going to be absolutely everywhere that we do software. And of course, we all know that software is absolutely everywhere that we do engineering. Now, given that open source is the fabric of computing, given that it is something that we need, it needs to be understood how we will use it. We need to have shared rules. We need to share the results. Open source, as I said, is not a solution in itself, but it's 80% of the solution that you need, no matter what sector you're in. Because everyone needs it, because everyone relies on the same foundation, we also need to rely on shared rules, shared understanding, so that we can get the results that we need. This has probably been one of the greatest challenges in open source governance. In the early days, well, how many of you were in this field 20 years ago? Oh God, are we dying off already? <laughs> um, in the early days, say 20 years ago, the open source community was so small that basically we all knew each other. And the idea of having shared rules was very simple. Now, it's very different. At a conservative estimate, we have tens of thousands of contributors to Linux alone. We have an enormous community around the world of individuals and companies across multiple geographies, across multiple languages, and across completely different understandings of, let's say, legal approaches and the requirements for things like copying and sharing. This has made it somewhat challenging to have clearly shared rules. And that, in turn, makes it somewhat difficult to have shared trust and great collaboration. This has been something that we've been dealing with in the background for many years now. We are probably at the brink of some great solutions to make sure that everyone is happy. But we still have a little bit of work to do. The challenges today, fundamentally, are based on the fact that we're not looking at a small community with shared agreements. We're looking at a very large community where some people have different understandings or different behavior. And on the edges of this community, we have faced some quite severe challenges in the governance area. How many of you have heard of Patrick McCarty? quite a few. Now, I know Heather was here, I believe, last year, and she mentioned Patrick McCarty's case. Uh, Patrick used to be a core developer in NetFilters, a contributor to the Linux kernel. He had quite a high profile. He receded from the active community of development, 
and began to undertake a series of lawsuits based on his code in the German legal jurisdiction. Now these lawsuits for the first two or three years exposed a slight difference of opinion between some individual developers and some corporate investors in open source. Patrick went after businesses that made mistakes in GPL licensing. And in the early days of his activity, people said, well, it sounds right. He's fixing something that's going wrong. He's forcing companies to behave. And companies said, there's something a bit off about this because we have Patrick approach us. We have to sign an agreement. Then he comes back with a huge laundry list of potential uh, additional violations and request a substantial amount of money. And for a few years this was going on where individual developers and aspects of the traditional development community felt that uh, nothing was amiss and corporates were increasingly saying behind closed doors something is extremely amiss. Thankfully, communication started to happen and we began to see as we talked with many people that the stories were aligned. Essentially, companies were being shaken down. And it had very little to do with community norms. It had very little to do with doing what's right. It had everything to do with a profit motive. Around last year, we began to see businesses talking more openly about what Patrick was doing. And we began to see the overall community engaging more actively in saying that some behavior is quite harmful. The NetFilter community released an enforcement statement very clearly stating that they believe everyone must follow the licenses, but also clearly stating that activities such as legal enforcement, court cases, should be a matter of last resort, not first resort. The Linux community released a statement as well. That statement was originally drafted by Grant. He's in the corner there. And we saw uh, additional activity in lawyers such as Heather clearly explaining why copyright trawling was a huge issue. I talk about this quite a bit because Patrick McCarty's activities litigating for what appears to be a pure profit motive were harmful to our community. But more challenging is the fact that he has created a line of activity that could be inspirational to more dangerous actors. You're all very familiar, I'm sure, with patent trolling. Copyright trolling is the last thing we want to see in open source. I would say that activity like that is probably our largest single challenge today. And it's a challenge that we're working on addressing but it's one that we haven't yet solved. The solutions that we're looking at in open source for governance tend to be about communication. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that nowadays our community is so interdependent that you can't split it out by one handful of stakeholders and another handful of stakeholders. You can't split it between individual developers and corporate investors. It's, it's quite frankly impossible. Over 70% of the code committed to the Linux kernel originates in corporate projects. But an awful, of that, an awful lot of that code is made by very high profile individuals. As we acknowledge our interdependence, as we understand that we must always work together in areas like law as well as software, we're beginning to apply solutions that rely on a certain type of community spirit. With McHardy, we had clear statements from NetFilter and the Linux kernel saying that speculative copyright enforcement is not something that our communities support. In other areas, such as corporate code, we saw clear statements from companies like Red Hat and Google saying that when it comes to, let's say, GPL2 licenses, they will only enforce them in certain ways, similar to uh, the GPL3 license. 
These solutions have all been about coming together, agreeing on shared norms, and making a certain pledge or promise to uphold them. This is terrifically important today. When we're looking at the cost of something like copyright trawling, we're talking about millions of dollars. When we look at the potential cost of breaking collaboration in the community, of not having shared understandings, of not working together, we're looking at billions of dollars of loss. Now, as we go through our solutions in this modern world, there's a tendency for the lawyers to think every solution is a contract, and there's a tendency for the engineers to think every solution is code. I'm a political scientist, so I think that every solution is an essay or manifesto. <laughs> and it's actually interesting. I don't know if you've noticed it, um, but somewhere at some point, political scientists like myself permeated open source and were popping up in all kinds of positions. The last president of Free Software Foundation Europe was a political scientist as well. And I think the reason you find us appearing is because it's a social community. It depends on social norms and social collaboration. The solutions, like I said, are cooperative. And I'm going to give an example through OpenChain. OpenChain is a project that's been running for about three years, but it's only been public for about a year. And this project is about addressing one simple question. How do I trust my supply chain? And I think this is probably a question that in an area such as China, people can really resonate with. Talking with embedded companies, the average supply chain has between 9 and 27 hops, going from the initial silicon to a finished product. And because open source is everywhere, it tends to enter the supply chain at numerous points. And with so many different hops where open source can be introduced, it's actually very hard to keep track of everything, and mistakes happen. That's actually the weakness in industrial production that McHardy manipulated. No matter what you do as an endpoint company with your sticker on a finished product, no matter how good you are at compliance, one of your suppliers somewhere might make one mistake, and that might fold into your products, and that might hit market. And you can do everything that you possibly can to try and catch it. But because of the complexity of code, because of the speed of products, something somewhere will go wrong. In open source, we had essentially expected that when someone finds that something went wrong, they'll let you know, and you can go and fix it. McCarty was the first time that we had someone who didn't care if you could fix it. He wanted to get money out of you from that mistake, no matter what you did next. And this meant that we had a serious problem with the global supply chain. Um, I used to help gplviolations.org. I used to run the legal department of Free Software Foundation Europe. Now, we used to do a lot of test purchases on devices. GPL violations would test purchase, and FSFE would help in analyzing what we should do. Can you guess the percentage of test purchases with an open source compliance problem? Yeah. 100%. We never had a test purchase that didn't find a problem. And, and that's fascinating, because a lot of these test purchases were from companies which do try hard and really do have sincere contributions to the community. And we were looking at a supply chain problem. And that particular problem is more than an abstract. In terms of our community, we need to work on that because we need to have shared trust. It's very hard to trust each other if not everyone is following the same rules. In terms of our ability to use open source, we need to make sure that those hiccups in the supply chain are less 
And when they do occur, we have a chance to fix them without big problems regarding finance or distribution of products. Now, OpenChain helps address this um, by, well, I suppose you could say giving the big picture. OpenChain is not designed to be a prescriptive set of code, prescriptive set of processes, or a prescriptive set of policies. This is where we are a little bit left field compared to a lot of other open source projects. OpenChain is about looking at a legal entity and saying it's got inbound processes for software, it'll have internal processes and outbound processes. And what we do is we ask organizations to confirm they have certain processes in place. Do you have an inbound process? Do you have an open source policy? Do you have a development process? Do you have an outbound process? We don't actually care what the process is, we just care that it exists. Because if the various companies in the supply chain can confirm they have these processes, the likelihood is they will catch open source software entering the products and they can describe it as it moves through the supply chain. That's why I said, how do I trust my open source supply chain? If they've got these processes in place, you can trust them more. And as a side effect, as they make a list of their processes internally, they can provide that information to their customers. This means that a company producing, let's say, a system on a chip can actually tell the purchaser who's putting it into a product, they can tell them how they monitored the code internally. This helps a lot in reducing problems. And it indicates a very promising future for us in open source. Given what I told you about our market situation, number one, we have a huge community. Everything that is software is related to open source. Number two, we have the emergence of things like copyright trolls who no longer follow the same community norms as before. Number three, we have a pretty consistent and excellent track record of having problems in our supply chain. And number four, we're thinking through how to solve them. Has led to an interesting mix of, I suppose, collaborations that we didn't have previously. It seems strange to say it, but the emerging and then clearly understood threat of Patrick McCarty brought together individuals and lawyers and companies in a way that we have rarely seen before in open source. Everything from Software Freedom Conservancy's uh, guidelines for GPL enforcement through to the statements by Red Hat about how they would deal with copyright enforcement around their own code has put us more in tune than ever before. And this harmony this collaboration has led to some fascinating and brilliant results. Patrick McCarty had a case just a week ago quashed in German court. Not because they rejected the GPL, not because they threw out enforcement as a viable option, but because they said McCarty was overreaching. He was trying to use the combined work of the Linux kernel as something he could used for litigation. And the court said, no, your own individual copyright is what you can use in a case. And you have not provided sufficient evidence regarding your individual copyright to maintain the current case. And thus it was that an overreaching trawl was squashed in one case. He'll be back. But we have a little bit of control about saying, no, you can't litigate with the whole kernel. Now, that particular case outcome didn't come from the company that was defending itself solely. There was support given, affidavits given, from all types of individuals and community organizations to help bolster that case. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our future. As we deal with open source growing, we now understand that we have to deal with governance in a slightly different way. One person's problem, one organization's challenge 
is a challenge for everyone using open source. We need to have clear understanding of our rules. And today, we have much clearer understanding than ever before. Grant's work with the Linux kernel uh, enforcement statement inspired NetFilter. NetFilter was first to market, so they win on speed. But it inspired NetFilter to make their statement. The Linux kernel made their statement. SFC released principles of GPL enforcement. We've seen a terrific amount of consolidation. And the future is not just statements and documents. The future is a lot of tooling to back this up. I don't know if you know it, but right now we've got somewhere in the region of eight or nine major projects helping with describing open source, scanning for open source, and continuous integration, continuous development. Open chain is basically at the top. We're like the ISO 9000 saying, do you have this overarching structure? Just below us, there's a project called SPDX, which says, here's how you describe what's in a file. Here's a license identifier. Here's other identifiers. Then we've got scanning tools like Fossology and ScanCode that can automatically scan through your code, read the identifiers, and tell you what's there. We've got CICD tools like Quartermaster. We've got catalog tools like SW360. We have new tools which have metadata for projects, like the recently announced Clearly Defined from Microsoft. Combined, these open source tools and solutions allow us to have end-to-end -end governance that can be automated to a very high degree and gives us a very good baseline of where we need to be. The future of open source governance is probably we keep doing exactly what we're doing. We keep working together. We take this momentum that was partially inspired by a, a negative actor in our field, and we use it to make sure that our supply chain is a, as effective as possible, that where mistakes occur, we can identify them and fix them as quickly as possible, and that as a community, we acknowledge the value of shared rules and shared understanding. We understand that the complexity of software, the complexity of the supply chain may lead to mistakes. But we also clearly understand that we can and must fix those mistakes so that we all remain confident in open source. I'm very optimistic about this future because in just the last five years alone, I've seen compliance change completely from something that was individuals trying to get large corporate entities to comply into having a pretty flat arena where virtually everyone agrees on the same ideas and is working actively to support them. Now, when Heather spoke last year, I've seen her talk, and it was an excellent talk. And I think it highlighted the sense of urgency we had around compliance at that point. What I'd like to do with my talk is to underline that we took the urgency on board and in every area of our community, we worked hard to address the challenge. And today, we're in a great position to have fair and reasonable compliance and to address trust between organizations and individuals. It's a very positive moment compared to the slightly worrying moment we had just 12 months ago. Now, as part of this, we're getting better at dealing with the fact that not everyone is from North America or the British Isles or Australia. And, and I'm from Ireland. I'm from the British Isles. And this is a colossal struggle for me, the idea that everyone doesn't speak English. But there you go. And that's where the next speaker comes in. So Lucian is going to come to stage, and he's going to tell you uh, a little bit about license compliance in Asia, first in English, but then he has an excellent talk coming up in Chinese. And that's what's really cool. The open source compliance community doesn't depend on figures like me coming and talking in English anymore. It's more of a beautiful courtesy that Linaro extended to me. <laughs> it has great thinkers and great minds available all over the world. And today, we have a Chinese speaker speaking Chinese and explaining how this works. Please welcome Lucian to stage.
Uh, thanks, Shen, for the introduction. I think I have uh, 10 minutes to do the uh, Asia update about license compliance. So, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, ah, uh, greeting everyone. My name is Lu Xuan, and you are very welcome to call my Chinese name, Lin Chengxia, if you like. Uh, I have been doing the open source legal research for about 10 years. Uh, about maybe 12 years ago, I was an uh, uh, <coughs> academic professional in Academia Sinica. Uh, now I am the legal advisor of Open Culture Foundation Taiwan. Uh, so uh, what I am going to introduce to you is a few uh, description about the update about uh, open source license compliance situation in Asia. To be clear, mainly in the Grand China area. So, uh, what I can share with you in the past 10 years, let's go back to 2005, uh, the D-Link lawsuit. Back to 2005, uh, I, don't, uh, I think not everyone in this room knows that uh, D-Link lawsuit may be the first, first one uh, <coughs> substantially ruled uh, open source about the GPL infringement in the whole world. Uh, this, uh, it is ruled in uh, uh, Berlin, uh, Germany. And D-Link is a uh, Taiwan-based uh, ICT company. It sells a lot of uh, embedded system equipment. Back to 2005 and 2006, uh, as far as I know, <coughs> Uh, people in Taiwan, engineers in Taiwan, in the ICT industry, they really don't know much things about uh, open source license and uh, the GPL. Uh, so, <coughs> most of the question they proposed to me uh, in, the ten, uh, in the 10 years ago uh, was uh, such a, I, I think, okay. so there's a point, no? No, no points. So, okay, there's a non laser point. So, so that, uh, let's just uh, describe it. Uh, that's the whole question, uh, most uh, frequent question they proposed to me. Uh, question number one, do we really have to use the GPL license code? I don't think they should propose this question to me. They should propose this question to the RD department themselves. The question number two, what does reinstatement mean? If we are not allowed to be reinstated, shall all the product be ceased to deliver? by current order. Yes, might be in serious, uh, in serious situation under GPL 2.0. And uh, question number three, why we have to provide the source code being written on our own? <clears throat> I think they, they just don't understand that their staff are doing the development based on other people's open source code. And uh, the question number four, <clears throat> how can the product be obfuscated so that no one will know there's a GPO license material inside. <coughs> uh, whenever they pro propose this question to me, I will let you know that uh, my ability in engineer is limited in uh, debugging and uh, <coughs> testing. <coughs> so if they really want to do the obfuscating, they have to find someone else to do that for them. But uh, every time I will tell them that this will cost you a punch of times and uh, Legally, uh, it will constitute uh, some, somewhat willful infringement if it, it had been identified and tested. Uh, question number five. Our own, source, uh, our own source code have been lost because of the engineers in charge have already left the employment. What can we do under these circumstances when we're receiving a warning later for source code? This is a real case in real life. Actually, it did happen a few times in the past 10 years. So they don't have any repository or version control system for the code that they use in the product. So what have been changed in the te uh, past 10 years? After uh, D-Link, there comes a series of lawsuits in the United States. This is a preliminary injunction issued by the federal court. Uh, in the uni United States, it, it is uh, Billy Box. Uh, in 2009, Billy Box, with the help of uh, 
uh, software freedom conservancy. It brought uh, the lawsuit low, uh, low, low, low against 14 uh, famous uh, ICT companies in the United States. As you can see, Samsung is in the list. And, and besides Samsung, the other, the other companies actually are the uh, partners of Taiwan OEN and ODNs. So this is a series of lawsuits that change the compliance scenes in Grand China area a lot. After that, uh, the, the company in Taiwan and the, the company in mainland China came for my consulting. They don't ask the question number one to number four, five anymore. <laughs> they are going proceed to the number six and seven. What exactly is the scope of source code we should provide? And uh, how can we properly attribute all the contributor notice and disclaimer with uh, so many uh, free and open source components in one single one product? So as you may might agree, there is uh, improvement in the attitude. Slow but positive in the open source compliance. Uh, in the past two years, a few, uh, a few companies based on mainland China even came to me for discussing about their strategy. They want to know how to put open source management into the competing strategy uh, in the future. But, but for now, we have to admit one thing. There is indeed different thinking ways between free and open source communities and OEN, ODN, so-called manufacturers. Uh, for the promoters and the communities, they believe beautiful coding shall be art. Yet for the manufacturers, I think they only want time to market. Uh, and for communities, they believe intellectual property rights can be owned respectively. But for the con uh, manufacturers, they just want to do, if they can, they just want to do the IPR management on its own. For communities, every contribution of code shall be attributed properly to an extent. And for the manufacturers, I think they appreciate no extra obligation imposed. And for the community, source code shall be provided openly among participants. But for many uh, manufacturers, if they can, they think the source code provision should not in conflict with the company's benefits. And overall, for communities, share the knowledge uh, is the one thing that they think they should do. But for the manufacturers, I, I think most of the manufacturers, uh, the department in charge, they think they just, they really want to keep the know-how confidentially, internally, if possible. So after, uh, I think, uh, just as like Shen mentioned, open source in today is like a fabric. No matter you like it or not, you believe it or not, it's a kind of a foundation we do the development of computing. So finally, we have to make the piece. So how can we make the piece? Based on the experiments I spent in the re open source research in the past 10 years, I think the main point is that we learn the rules from the license, we honor the rules from the license, and we have to find a way that make the companies the manufacturers and the community work together pos positively. So what I can share to you is that if you want to make your company com compatible with the open source license obligation, the most uh, crucial part is that you have to do the fundamental training for your engineers. You have to let the engineers learn copyright spirit in training courses courses for the better judgment because uh, for open source they are different from a commercial uh, solution. For commercial solution, your legal department will decide which one you should buy, which one you can use, but for the open source solution, they are usually used by the engineers, by the research department itself. So you have to do these things in training. So. Uh, I think the most part I can contribute to the Nano Connect this year uh, is trying to uh, share my experience about how to expand in plain world and in interactive mode with the uh, developers 
that the MacLearn can understand the license obligations in simple way, clear but a simple way and a doable way. So in the 11 o'clock, I will hold a workshop about a common understanding of copyleft in this very room. Uh, uh, because most of the scenario, most of the uh, misunderstanding scenario are collected from the Grand China area. The workshop will be delivered in Chinese. But uh, the slide of the workshop are made both in English and the Chinese. So if you find anything interesting to you in the slides, uh, please feel, uh, feel free me to send me your suggestion or finding uh, through the email. Uh, so thank you for your patience and attendance for the update. Now, before you get rid of us off the stage, because technically we still have a tiny bit of time, <laughs> I, I wanted to give you two, two insights. Um, one is that a couple of years ago, when I was dealing with governance, people would often talk about mainland China as if companies didn't understand copyright. And that's always been incorrect. And some companies in China deserve to be given credit as leaders in open source governance. Huawei, for example, has had a great open source team for many years and has been very proactive in working with the international community. So one thing I'd like to stress is that even though we come from different cultures, we have a great amount of shared understanding of what we need for third parties to work together. The second thing is to give, I think, a rosy picture of the dark, deep underground of compliance, what really, what really happens out there. In two years, between 2006 and 2008, when I was running FSFE's legal department and collaborating with GPL violations, we addressed and solved upwards of 150 cases. And less than 1% needed to be taken into any form of legal uh, interaction. The vast majority of cases at that time, when we got a pure 100% score of incompliance, no matter where we looked, the vast majority of the cases were resolved by communication and by collaboration. And since that time, now 10 years later, we've got a lot better at this. And I think Lucian is one of the key examples of someone who has spent over a decade going around training people nonstop. And it's had a tremendous impact on bringing us all closer together. So, this workshop at 11, I think, is a bit of a milestone for us. Um, Lucian has been doing workshops in mainland China, I believe in Taiwan as well, helping an awful lot of people understand. But today's workshop kind of is a, a moment, a milestone, where a very large international community with a very large international conference gives a track in the local language on this topic and gives plenty of room for people to have great learning. I think Lenaro deserves great credit here for making that happen. So on that note, thank you very much all. I appreciated your time. And if anyone's got an urgent question, we can take it now or later. Ah, oh, you're looking for the mic? Oh, the clicky thing. Here you go. Wrap us up today very quickly. Uh, in Burlingame, in the last Connect, we announced the developer box so you could develop arm on arm, which was a really exciting thing. It was a great event. So now we're at the next Connect. And I happen to wonder, well, where are we with the developer box and how's it looking? And has this turned out to sort of realize the vision that we had for it? So since then, Daniel Thompson has been using the developer box and I asked him to just come in briefly this morning and share with us his experience using the developer box. Thank you. Well, I'm Daniel Thompson. Um, I work for Lenaro. And uh, this, I, I didn't write the title of this presentation. This was given to me by somebody else. And I thought I would really do my research, make sure I got it absolutely right. So the world's first ARM developer box. Somebody beat us to it. 1987, the Aiken Archimedes. <laughs> um, the most astonishing thing about this computer 
It was a great technical achievement. If there's project managers in the room, it was perhaps an even more outstanding project management achievement. Um, so yeah, it came with BBC Basic and Assembler built in. Um, it ran an obscure OS named Arthur, 8 megahertz, 1 megabyte of RAM by default. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's 31 years ago, we still got beaten to the second one. That was 1994, the Acon Risk PC. Um, it still had BBC Basic and Assembler built into it. Uh, it also ran an obscure OS, slightly faster processor now. It had a modern MMU in it. This was the first ARM to get a proper MMU. Um, it had 32 megabytes of RAM and was based on 4K pages. Then, however, there is a 24-year gap, and I've challenged people, and come and find me afterwards if you can fill in the gaps, but I think the next PC form factor was the 2018 96 Wars developer box from, with Synchroso in it. Um, so this has EFI shell built in, which is arguably a regression compared to BBC Basic. Um, it runs an obscure kernel named Linux. It's got the Synchroso 24-core A53 gigahertz processors, processors in it. Um, it has four gigs of RAM, um, although it's, that's in the kit. It's expandable to 64 gigs. Um, so this is 100 times the memory of the RISC PC. And you still have to put it into 4K pages if you want 32 by ARM containers to work or you want the NVIDIA Nuvo driver to work. Um, the box itself could do 64K pages, no problem at all. Um, so, but just think about that 100x increase in, page size, in memory size, still using the same size pages. If I shall, um, like I say, BBC Basic is not built into the developer box, um, but I can offer you a simple workaround. You can apt get uh, a brandy, which is a BBC dialect basic interpreter. It will give you 512K of code space for you to store your basic programs. Um, but I'm going to add that I can't consider the EFI shell to be a regression. Um, so please ignore all the mean things I've just said about it. Um, one of the key things about developer box is we were able to get best in class kind of EFI firmware running on this box. So firmware done right, EDK2 tailored specifically for the developer box uh, by our enterprise group. Um, ARD's even negotiated with Richard Hughes and arranged for um, updates over the air via the Linux vendor firmware service. So if you are running the update daemon in your distro, um, it will be capable of upgrading the firmware as it goes. You don't have to worry about it. it finally, it includes a binary translator because um, what we discovered is that the um, cards that we want to plug into C graphics um, have, it's not called the video bias anymore, but you know what I mean. It has x86 code needed to initialize the clocks and allow us to put menus up from the firmware. Um, so we have a translator in there to do that. And the result is you have a box that boots and looks and feels like a PC. So it boots and it shows a cute splash screen and then it goes into Grub. And from Grub, you can run your ISO, you can run regular distro installers, um, and that is backed up by really strong distro support. So um, comprehensive kernel support kind of comes in in the 4.16 era. So that's when we got the network drivers upstreamed. Um, and so we can do a whole bunch of distros. I've put the ERP in gray for exactly the reasons that Kenneth was referring to. It's not really a distro, um, but it is a framework in which we could do a lot of testing. So you will be able to install the ERP on the developer box um, well, probably forever, but we will stop promoting it after a few months when the distros start to take in the newer kernels. And that should be coming really soon. Fedora 28 is going to be based on 4.16. We sincerely hope that providing the kernel is configured with all the modules enabled, uh, it will work out the box. It is configured with all module enabled. Um, likewise, Ubuntu 18.4 uh, uses 4.15, but they agree to backport the network driver. Um, so that has been tested as well. That's known to work. Um, and then the kind of, uh, that's the device tree versions. In a firmware switch, you can flick over to ACPI mode, um, and that brings alive what you might call the John Master's dream. Um, you can take the distros from last year, Debian Stretch is not even last year, based on a 4.9 kernel, and it will boot the developer box. At the moment, you will need some special command line options. Um, and it turns out, we were really chuffed by this, it turns out those command line options are working around bugs. And because they're working around bugs, we will get those bug fixes back into the long-term stable kernels. And because it will get back ported, that means when we see the Debian refresh, things like Debian 9.5 come out, uh, that will have the newer LTS backport. It's, it's queued now for the next LTS. Um, so we'll see that come out. Uh, CentOS is based on a slightly different kernel. Um, it will require the same workarounds as Debian 9 at the moment. And they've done what you might call the right thing. They've got 64K pages, um, which is awesome, and will get lovely, wonderful performance, but unfortunately means that you will have to also blacklist the Nuvo driver if you want it to boot up. This is my developer box. 
it has been my privilege and joy to take one of these home from the last Connect. Um, I have to say, Harry the Hub, this little robot, isn't there because he's cute. He's working around uh, some board design problems with the prototypes. Uh, and my boards also had some mods, and I had my friend Lee soldering bits on and off it uh, so that we could get it stabilized. And I'm really looking forward, because fairly soon now, the production board will be posted to my house, and I shall dig it out, and uh, I shall plug it all in. I shall also add this is a hugely oversized box so that I can engineer it. It actually doesn't fit very well on my desk. So when I get the new case, I will actually be quite pleased because I get my desk back. Um, so my box is currently upgraded to 8 gigs of RAM, 512K gig SSD, and since early November, it has been my main computer for all the work I do for Lenaro. Uh, and the reason I did that was that I wanted to personally find out how we're doing in the ecosystem. We say the software is nearly there. In fact, we've learned through a lot of speakers the software is there. Um, and that's been, roughly speaking, my experience. So um, this is my huge success story. This is something called Uroot, which is a rather obscure root file system. It's a busy box alike, written in Go. And it has the really neat property that it's source-based. So what happens when you build a uroot is it creates you a Go compiler, copies it into the root file system, and then dumps all the source code into a source tree and uh, has just enough hooks in it that it will dynamically compile that source code uh, and then cache it uh, when you run things. And that's, I was just really excited to see source connected so directly like that. Um, and I fired it up and in the afternoon, I was, I was expecting to have a happy afternoon playing and fixing all the bugs, kind of like getting X to work in the old days. And I was actually really disappointed because it worked, it just worked. <laughs> um, so you can go get it, you can run it, and that will create you the init MFS. Um, and then you get this marvelous thing, you can just type kernel boot VM Linux from QMU and it will boot. And that's what it's doing in this video here. So that types LS, it has just dynamically compiled LS. Um, we're now going to look to see if we can see the source. The last thing you'll see is the source coming up on the screen that has just dynamically compiled. I will concede that to get that to fit into the time I was just speaking, I have accelerated things. So, for example, it does take quite a few minutes to generate the MFS, which it was doing while I was speaking a moment ago. So don't take that as a performance reference. Um, but it is, you know, that was generally f recorded on a, busy uh, on a developer box, uh, and you've just seen what it can do. It was an epic fail, I, I have to balance it up. Um, and it was also Go related, actually. Um, so Go didn't add Arch64 support until 1.1, uh, 1.5. And 1.5 was also the very first Go compiler that was written in Go. And obviously self-hosting compilers are much cooler than ones written in C, so that was awesome. But um, Open Embedded um, doesn't want to depend on the host Go compiler because lots of people haven't installed it yet. Um, so it works by using the host C compiler to build the C version of Go uh, and then change it on. So I know how to fix it, you just use the host Go compiler on ARM64. Um, but while I say I know how to fix it, I have not yet learnt how to express that in open embedded syntax. And yeah, if people who've used open embedded will recognize why I haven't done that yet. Um, so I have the final kind of wrap up here, which is the kind of love it, hate it. And the, the key thing for me was that almost everything just works. Um, you don't sit there day to day saying, oh, I wish I had my PC so I could run this tool, or at least I didn't. Um, so that, that was the main take home that I picked up. You know, Chromium is working wonderfully. It was a great joy not to cross compile all the time, um, to have native KVM, to have native ARM containers. I put a blog post out this morning from the work I did with the native ARM containers. Um, parallel builds are fairly fast, I and mean, this is a fast, it's a, it's a performance per watt machine, it's not huge single thread performance. Um, but parallel builds are, are pretty good. They outpaced my 2017 laptop. I suspect a 2018 laptop, sorry, my 2017 laptop. I suspect it might not keep up with an 18 laptop. Um, so there's only a couple of things I can really say that I, I didn't enjoy about the experience. And the first one really surprised me, which is that um, you go to a website, it sniffs the browser string, it says ARM, and it says, oh, ARM, ARM do mobile, don't they? And they show you the mobile version of the website which in the case of Google Calendar looks rubbish at full size. Um, so, yes, one of the odd hacks is you have to install an x86 browser emulator as an extension to your browser, otherwise you get stuck with mobile websites from time to time. The other thing, of course, like I say, this was designed to be a performance per watt machine. It has, it, so when you hit desktop applications particularly, uh, where they're single-threaded, um, that will reveal the, the limits of a one gigahertz A53. I mean, even that was a good thing because one of those single threaded applications was my mail user agent, and it meant I could go back to MUT, which has also been a regressive joy in many ways. 
So, uh, that's about it, and I thank you all. Before I stop, I have this Monty Python foot to remind me that I need people to get on their feet right now, because I am, in many ways, a total fraud standing here. Um, you know, I gate-crashed the developer box party uh, just before the last connect, because I was so excited about the project, I wanted to be part of it. And I've said we continually through this presentation, and so I think we need to stand up, which means all the guys at the Naro Enterprise Group who've worked on this, the Socinex development team, the Socinex landing team, so anybody both from Socinex and Lenaro and 96 boards who's been working on this product, please self-identify and stand up. If I see people not standing up, I will point you out. Um, so yeah, get on your feet if you've had impact on the developer box. Please, stand up. Jazzy, you have to stand up. <laughs> And that's, that's it for me. Thank you all very, very much for your attention. Okay, right on time. So, gala tonight. Uh